All right, so I can still see that attendees are slowly trickling in, but uh, let's get started in the interest of time. So let me introduce our uh, speaker, uh, Nisha Talagala. She, is, uh, she has a PhD in CS from Stanford and has several years of experience in the field of artificial intelligence and computer science. And she feels very passionate about inspiring young minds to learn and get motivated about AI. She has 11 year old daughter and that was kind of, you know, what started uh, her motivation to um, have something that enables them to see the power of AI early on and get inspired to pursue something like this. So without much delay, let's hear from her. Thank you very much, Sindhu. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. So, yeah, so thank you everyone and welcome to our webinar. And uh, we are going to be t teaching, talking to you today about, you know, how kids, even as young as in elementary school, can come to appreciate the technology of artificial intelligence. So what are we going to cover in the webinar today? We'll tell you a little bit about who we are and then talk to you about, you know, what what you know what we are basically working on to help kids learn ai so who are we so we are um, experts in software and in artificial intelligence and we have developed and continue to develop education programs for kindergarten through 12th grade and beyond um you know not just myself but you know many members of our team are also computer science and artificial intelligence phds um, and so we've designed this program with not just the eye to children, but also from a deep understanding of what artificial intelligence actually is and how, what are the most important concepts that you want to convey to people who are trying to learn. Uh, we have proven success with students and parents. Uh, we've had hundreds of students from, you know, ages uh, of, you know, from, from the K through 12 uh, groups join, take various courses from us and learn. They have built hundreds of projects. Uh, you know, parents come back and, you know, um, are able to see what their kids have learned. And educators are also able to see how they can communicate, you know, about this uh, powerful technology to kids through these programs. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've had hundreds of AI projects built by students as young as, you know, eight or nine years old, just up to all the way through high school. And, you know, several of our students have gone forward to, you know, build socially impactful projects and also win a number of competitions. So what do we do? We basically, you know, um, you know, we provide programs and provide tools that help students and educators learn AI. Uh, we work with educators, we, you know, work with students, we provide resources to parents, to educators alike. We maintain a website called AIclub.world where you can find lots of resources, a lot of free resources as well, um, and as well as, you know, structured programs for people who want to learn AI. And what you see here is some testimonials from, you know, educators that have worked with us, some competitions that our students have won, some surveys we've done of students that has shown us that you know, after going through an initial program of learning artificial intelligence, all of them want to learn more. All of them want to see themselves being able to apply it to solve problems. They want to run, learn more programming and a little about 42% of them also want to learn math. So we found that it is a very powerful motivator to encourage students to learn STEM as well. You know, not just about artificial intelligence, but it increases their curiosity to learn other things. So what are we going to cover in this webinar today? First is um, why should kids learn AI? And the second is how can kids this young learn a, a technology that is kind of generally assumed to be very complicated? And where does programming fit into all this? You know, do they need to know a lot of programming? What's going on here? Because typically kids this young don't always know a lot of programming. We'll provide lots and lots of examples of the way that we take approach and what we have found and what we have found kids are able to do. We'll also give you a bunch of pointers on how to get started. So first of all, you know, let's talk a bit about why should you learn artificial intelligence and what is it anyway? So generally speaking, I mean, AI is many things, but a very short way to think about it is that AI is a whole group of 
techniques that computer programs can use to do things that come easily to the human brain. And so these could be things like recognizing images, predicting the future, detecting when something is unusual or anomalous, you know, making strategies like plans on how to win a game or, you know, how to beat an opponent, find recognizing sounds, things of that nature. And all of these fall into the broad bucket of artificial intelligence. Now, artificial intelligence is used every day in real life. And this is also, by the way, one of the reasons why we encourage kids to learn artificial intelligence and learn it early is because it is actually all around them, whether they decide to learn it or not. So if you look at, for example, you know, anything that involves, you know, recommending a, a product to buy, or if you're deciding to watch a movie, if something is being recommended to you, if you are using a phone or any kind of a text messaging app and it has a tendency to try to complete your sentences or correct your spelling, if you have ever been, you know, seen a self-driving car or, or heard about one on the news, if you've ever used a digital assistant that's like the ones on your phone or the ones in your home, you know, if somebody has ever predicted the weather for you or tried to, you know, recommend you something to buy depending on your mood, all of these are applications of artificial intelligence. And so these days when children interact with devices, they're almost always interacting with some type of AI. And the question is whether they know that that's happening and whether or not they are able to understand what's happening behind the device that is talking to them and whether they're able to kind of use that to sort of improve the way that they think and the way that they function. There are also many things that kids, particularly school age kids can do if they know a little bit of AI. You know, today we'll give you an example of some, uh, a group of kids who built a community project. You know, there are many examples of, you know, being able to play games, being able to do, you know, high, you know, uh, uh, undergraduate or actually pre-undergraduate research, like in high school or in middle school. There are, you know, kids who feel passionate about the environment, can do various environmental and agriculture projects, some of which our students have done, you know, even at very young ages, like 10 or 11. And so there are many things that kids can do to apply artificial intelligence to problems that they understand already in their communities and ways that they can see how learning these technologies can actually make a meaningful difference, which then in turn increases their desire to learn more because they can very quickly kind of see how it is related to the things that are around them. So this brings up the question of how do you approach, you know, this kind of a technology to kids that are say eight years and older, but still very young. And how do you get it to the point, you know, get them so that they are not intimidated by it, they are not overwhelmed by it. And, but they are also able to understand, you know, in the context of the way they think, you know, how it applies to the world around them. And how do you make it sort of appropriate for their age group so that it makes sense to them, they're excited by it. At the same time, you know, it does not necessarily go into the level of depth that they are clearly not ready for from a, from a, both a mathematical as well as a computer science kind of a perspective. So first of all, the reason that this is accessible is because, as we already said, lots of examples are all around them. And they're around them even if they may not even realize that it's around them. It, it, you know, AIs have a tendency to be very interactive and it's very easy to communicate with an AI in a very human-like way. And this is also part of the reason why they're already interacting with AIs, whether they know it or not. With new technologies like the ones that we are going to show you, kids can build AIs with no code at all. And we mean literally no code at all. They can interact with it. They can start to understand what the AI is good at. They can start to understand that AIs are not perfect and are certainly capable of mistakes as well. This makes them more curious, more excited about the technology. And as they build more, even if they start life with writing no code, we have found pretty much 100% of the time that an interest in AI almost always leads to an interest in programming. And so they, as they learn more and they want to do more and they want to apply more, they get very excited about the underlying sort of themes and technologies that you know, are inside these you know, entities that they can talk to. So that's really the reason why we suggest that you can actually start very young and then you can also get, get their natural interest and natural problem solving interest to fuel the, you know, the further learning that they are absolutely capable of doing. So now let's talk a bit about where does coding fit in? 
Um, and so, first of all, there's a fairly common misconception that AI requires coding. Now, this is actually not true. It has been true for many years, but it has not been true for the last few years. And so the approach that we take, you know, and we'll show you this in a moment, is that we enable students to use AIs and build new AIs with no coding at all. And the reason we approach it this way so that then they can focus on what makes the AI itself interesting and fun and also challenging. And they can kind of bring in as much or as little code as they see fit. However, this is the first step. So they can start here, no coding at all, not even drag and drop coding. And then when they are, you know, whenever they're ready, they can connect the AI to code and that can be done very, very easily. And so we'll show you a demo today of how to connect an AI to Scratch code, but you can really connect it to anything, Scratch, Python, Java, JavaScript, and so forth. So once you are able to build them and you're able to connect them, now you're pretty, you know, in a pretty powerful position that you can build apps. And even apps with a very small amount of programming in it can be very powerful because the AI is powerful. So the next thing that you can do is you can build an app. And we will show you a demo today of a simple um, iPhone app that was actually built by a 12 year old. You know, and once you're able to build apps, now you have a lot of tools at your disposal and those tools you can use to solve real world problems. And so we'll show you a demo of a group of kids that did that as well. So this is really the progression that we recommend. So it's not that you know, the AI has no coding, it's that the coding can be learned in parallel, it is not required to get started, and it doesn't have to be in any particular language. And you can kind of you know, pair your artificial intelligence learning with your programming learning in pretty much any language that you like. And you don't necessarily have to stick to the same language either. Like you could start with scratch, as you know, as you as the student gets older, they may want to learn additional languages. So, and from an educator perspective, you know that the educators can decide depending upon their classroom, the may, you know the students they have, what tools they have at their disposal. Maybe they're in a position to teach Scratch. Maybe they're not in a position to teach Python, and that's totally okay. So, so depending on your specific circumstance and the interest and the you know the background of your students, you can kind of you know decide what you want to do in the coding realm and make and see that your AI can sort of happen very complementary to your coding you know, approach. So generally what we have seen students sort of go through the process of is we, know, uh, we provide programs, for example, where they can use and build AIs with no coding at all. Now, as they learn more about the AI itself, they learn different types of AIs, they learn what it means for an AI to learn, the kind of mistakes it can make, how to help it fix its mistakes, things like that. And they're able to apply this technology to real world problems. In parallel, they typically you know, want to build apps, you know, build really interesting solutions to problems using their newfound knowledge. And they can do that in pretty much any language that they like. So they typically start by trying to connect the AI to some kind of code. Sometimes they also connect the AI to hardware like Arduinos or Raspberry Pis or things like that. And so you have sort of a very powerful AI learning that goes on. You can connect it to other things that you are learning anyway, like programming, like robotics, things like that. And the more tools that you have, the more you're capable of solving real world problems by building solutions that basically interact with the environment learn how to, you know, how to respond to the environment and then respond. So this is the path that we typically take through our learning programs. And what we have found is we, you know, because of how different students, you know, because the AI technology is so new, sometimes even, you know, middle school or high school students have to start here because they may not necessarily have any background because the technologies are so new. So generally, you know, we found students of an extremely wide range be benefit from this approach where they learn, they get excited, they may know some programming, they know how to connect it. Now they're feeling powerful and then they can build things, interesting things that they can be very proud of. So the approach that we take, particularly for very young students, you know, young students like in the elementary kind of grade, is we start by helping them understand how they already know that there's AI in their daily life. 
so we think explain to them how shopping sites work you know tell them a little bit about like if they're using a phone and it's doing autocorrect what is it actually doing you know if they walk into an airport and there's a camera you know staring at them what is happening behind the scenes with that camera it just helps them to connect and realize that this is not some esoteric technology it's a technology that's in their lives every day we also enable them to interact with live ais and i'll show you a demo of that in a minute now why does this help because very quickly they when they interact with live ais very quickly they realize that ais are good at some things and not good at other things in particular they they frequently find that an ai's perspective on something like happiness or sadness may be quite different from their own and so they typically interact with it and then they come away saying okay i think i agree with it on the following thing i disagree on this other thing then they are extremely motivated to try to improve it and so then they take a great deal of pleasure in improving it making it their own and as they see the ability to teach an ai and have it respond to what they have taught it then they are very motivated to understand how that works and how they can make it better so through this approach you know a kids naturally develop an interest and an investment because every child what they create after they start teaching it on their own every single ai is different from child to child so they may have interacted with the same one at this stage they will come away usually with vastly different observations on what they think is right or wrong with it by the time they've gotten to this point each one of them has basically created a new creation that is pretty much a reflection of something that they believe and after that then they are very very kind of motivated to understand how it works and also to how to make it better so overall this is the approach that we've taken and it's an approach that basically just engages their natural curiosity their ability to sort of understand basic things and does not put too much pressure on them to understand for example anything involving mathematics or programming until they're ready the other thing about that about our approach that you know we have found to be very helpful and it's also rather unique is we do not um need software installations of any kind so all the kids can do everything they want just inside the browser now this turns out to be an enormously valuable thing when you are particularly teaching younger children uh, for a whole bunch of reasons so first of all you know it's very hard for them to handle any kind of software installation and it's extremely hard for the educators if they have to you know worry about the you know any software installation issues across a large group of kids the other thing is that because of the no software installs and the fact that everything is completely online and browser accessible it means that students could be doing you know some work in in class go home do a little bit more work on their home computer because nothing is local it's all on the internet educators can always see what's going on regardless of where the kids did it you know and basically you know it just simply makes it much easier and this is even before the you know the time of online learning online learning as we're all experiencing right now simply makes this problem so much harder and the no software installation becomes that much more critical if you have you know students who are not in your classroom anymore who are basically learning from their homes with all sorts of different computers at hand certainly you do not want to be dealing with any kind of a software installation so that's one thing that's very foundational to our approach and we have personally found that to be a lifesaver in just getting things done the second thing which we have already talked about is our approach of being extremely flexible with respect to what kind of programming language and what kind of programming we're talking about and we found students for example who can get very advanced they're just simply not fond of coding we've other found other students who absolutely love scratch and will not do any other coding other than scratch and so for therefore they should be able to connect to their scratch programs others never really learn scratch they learn python from day one some learn java and so we want to be able to reach all of them and be able to let them use the capabilities that they know the capabilities they care about and help them sort of learn and go through this journey with what they have and what they want the final thing is that since ai is relatively new you know some of it is you just have to see examples and so as i will show you later we have hundreds of examples and ideas most of them built by kids themselves and what we have found is that when you give kids a group of ideas they come up with some amazingly unique things all by themselves and every unique idea they come up with is just another thing for another child to refer to and be inspired by 
So this is, you know, this is our overall approach. And I'm going to get into a little bit of this last one in for a few minutes here. First, so what I want to talk about is what about the data? So AI is learned from examples. And one of the things that makes AI is hard for people to do is because data is a requirement. And the question is, okay, now we're teaching kids AI, where does the data come from? So what we found, you know, the hard way a long time ago was that most of the data that is out there is not friendly to children. And the reason it's not friendly, some of it is just hard to understand. And some of it is just not the kind of thing you would put in front of a young child. You know, for, for example, if you are looking for, you know, detecting mood, you know, there's lots of data out there that is, you know, from adult descriptions, like, you know, something that someone might have written on Facebook or Twitter or something like that. And it may be perfectly fine for, you know, a business to detect mood, but it is not the kind of text you would want to put in front of a child. And so kid friendly data is extremely important. And so we actually invested a lot of time in this, you know, quite some time ago, and we basically created hundreds of kid friendly data sets. And how did we do this? A combination, you know, some of it we created by hand, some of it that's that we scoured the public world of adult data sets for things that we felt were suitable for children. Some of it was we even had groups of high school students, you know, crowdsource and create brand new data sets for their younger peer, you know, uh, for their for students younger than them, but understanding what the students younger than them would need. And so this has been a huge help to us because we're able to provide students with a large variety and a large selection, but a selection that is suitable for their age group. So this is a very important thing when you start thinking about, you know, trying to create variety. Say you don't want to just create one project or two projects. You want them to get excited and have tons of projects. In that case, you need a ton of different data sets. The next thing is what we talked about is project ideas. You know, for kids to know what can be done, they should see examples of what has been done. The ideas serve as inspiration. Some of them are also ideas for sample data. So we've had hundreds of students go through our um, curriculums and we are extremely focused on project-based learning. So, you know, in our um, programs, every student comes up with a problem they care about and then they work on solving that problem and that becomes a project idea for them and for other people. So our website, for example, contains hundreds of projects created by K-12 students on their own uh, motivation with their own ideas. So you can see some, you know, one, this one, for example, is about detecting what kind of Disney princess you are. This one is about predicting the battery life on your phone. Uh, this one is, um, I actually don't know, I think this was for detecting some kind of penguin. This one was to detect disabilities, you know, and things like that. And so the projects vary very widely. Some of them are about games. Some of them are about Pokemons or Harry Potter. Some are more science oriented, you know, like battery life, you know, age, sometimes about jobs, you know, sometimes about the prices of cars, sometimes about finding the best type of shoe for a teenager. So the idea is just kind of very massively and having a database of ideas just makes it easier for kids to know what's possible and then come up with their own unique idea. So now that you kind of understand sort of what we do, and by the way, um, I think Sindhu has been passing, you know, noting on the chat that you can um, put questions on, you know, and then we'll take all the questions at the end. So now that we've given you some ideas, what I'm going to do is show you some demos because that's the best way to kind of get a sense of what this actually looks like in practice. So we're going to go through, ooh, sorry. We're going to go through six different demonstrations. And the first one is, we talked about how, how it is, you know, it should be very easy for kids to interact with live AIs. So I'm going to show you guys a little video because this is a short webinar and you know, we don't have a lot of time. Rather than showing live demos, um, I decided to record some quick videos so that we can go through them quickly because we have about six different demonstrations that we'd like to show you. So the first thing I'm gonna show you is a little example of three different types of live AIs that are available on our website for kids to interact with. So I'm going to find, turn on my quick time and play the video. So I'm going to start sharing my screen again. 
So this is again, like I said, this is what it looks like for someone to try an AI that's already live and running on their behalf. And they try it entirely through the browser. So they open up a browser window and then they just type in questions and it provides predictions and answers. basic idea. So once you've you know, built an AI through the tools that we use, there's a simple web page that comes up that any child can see on their browser. If they are typing in answers to questions that are numbers, then they enter in numbers. If they are typing in sentences that they would like the AI to try to understand, they just type in any sentence they like. If they are looking for the AI to recognize an image, they just bring in any image they like. It could be an image they found on the internet, something they took from their phone. It doesn't really matter they bring in the image and then the AI will tell them what the image is. So this is a very easy way for kids to interact. They don't necessarily need to know how it works, but they get a very good sense of how it behaves. And particularly when you think about things like happy or sad, it's very easy for them to figure out if it gets it wrong because they have a very fine tuned sense of what they think happiness and sadness is. So, so the, those are the kinds of things that make it very easy for kids to interact with it. And they come away correctly, say, feeling that it's good at some things and not good at other things. So that's the first uh, thing that we uh, wanted to show you. And so that's our first demo. Now the second demo is, so let's say that they, you know, they interact with one and they decide, you know what, I don't think this one is good. I think I can build a better one. So now how do they build it? And how can they build it particularly without writing any code at all? So that's what we will show you in our second demo. So let me find my quick time again. Good. So now what we're going to show you is how the happy and sad AI that you saw in the triad actually gets built. And as I mentioned, we have a large number of data sets that you, know, you can use. This is one of them. But kids can also take this data set, add on to it, make examples of their own if they feel that the data set is not as, as good as they would like it to be. And we frequently encourage them to do that as a follow on step. actually showed you in the triad, the first one. This is a simple flow of how you could build pretty much exactly that one. So typically this process takes less than five minutes. And one of the things that we have found is that because it's so easy to build, it is very, very easy for you know, kids to build them. It's easy for kids to try them out. It's simple. And you can see that it doesn't involve any code. It's just a bunch of mouse clicks, but it also enables them to try it out. 
frequently want to make it better and then they can repeatedly you know uh, train teach it again and again and with every iteration they can see it get better so this we have found has greatly facilitated the learning process of you know helping them build them very quickly you know with and then as they want to learn more there are more details that they can explore but at the beginning they don't have to learn a lot of depth to just get started so next, what we want to show you is, okay, so now we've built one and we've tried them out. So how do I connect this to a, a program and say we want to connect it to Scratch? So say that I wanted to take the same happy or sad AI and I wanted to connect it to a Scratch program. So that's what we are going to show you next. So once again, I'm looking for my quick time, which has also disappeared again. So, all right, where is my Scratch going to Here we go. So now I'm going to show you guys how the Scratch program is connected. Now, before I pro play this video, I'm just gonna show you that this is the entire program that is connecting to the Scratch. And what it is doing is it's going to just ask the you know, kid some questions. It's going to send the questions over to the AI, get back a response and print it out and do, you know, do that again. And so kids can obviously do anything else they want with it. They can make the characters dance, they can have interactions, all of that is depending on their knowledge of Scratch and whatever they may want to do. The connection to the AI is really simple and it is pretty much entirely in these two lines, these two code blocks. connection of the live AI to a program is actually very easy. And what we have found is by providing samples of programs, you know, in a variety of languages, kids can basically take that sample, they can connect with it, they can enhance it. And then over time, they do learn how the sample works, which is a good thing. But it's usually easy to provide lots of samples. And so we typically provide samples, you know, in um, some in Scratch, some in Python, some in um, Java and JavaScript some in HTML, so, so all of those are things that then kids can go and work off of. So that is typically the level at which, you know, entry level students, particularly entry level students in the elementary uh, level tend to be able to engage. Uh, it's a good start for them, it gets them excited, they start understanding how stuff works. As students move more into the middle school range and, you know, and beyond, then they start being able to build their own projects and we provide lots of templates for these things as well. And the templates we provide are, for example, this particular one I'm going to describe is a, is a template of a small um, uh, iPhone uh, app that they can borrow and then they can build upon it and connect it to their own AI. And this was this is more of a middle school level kind of project, but it is basically at the lower end of middle school. So think sixth grade or about 11 or 12 years old. So that's what we are going to show now. And this is a, a little app that was uh, that uh, you know, a student built to um, basically be able to take a photograph of an animal from their phone and then be able to use an AI to predict what kind of animal it is.
an example of the kind of progress that they make after they've learned a little bit. So basically they're excited about solving their own problems and given you know, some amount of templates and some interest in coding, and we find that they can actually create some fairly cool apps. Now, some students prefer to do you know, projects that don't really involve any applications at all. Sometimes they just want to solve a problem and they just want to solve it by gathering data and then being able to you know, predict things based on the data. You know, and so what I want to show you now is a, a presentation of a student. He was in fifth grade, I believe, so about 10 years old. And you can hear him live presenting. What he wanted to do was to predict which Harry Potter Hogwarts house someone would be in, depending on the things that they type. So I'm going to share with you guys his live presentation of his project that he did some time back. Let me find it. There we go. Okay, um, I'm going to share my screen. And because he's presenting live, this is a little bit longer. It's about two minutes, but it's very fun to hear him. of a live uh, presentation that we've seen you know, kids do. And, and what, what you can really take away from this is that, first of all, the, the problems that they want to solve are usually their own ideas. Some students vector towards science, some vector towards books, some towards cartoons, some towards games. And being able to, for them to be able to see that they can actually apply these technologies to so many variants of things means that they can each create their own project and apply it in their own way. And as you probably saw in that video, um, basically you can see how proud he was that the, his AI got 100% accuracy. So they're very, very invested in knowing, uh, seeing whether the AI can learn really, really well. And they invest a lot of time and energy to make sure that happens. And that's part of how they learn because they become very curious as to how to do it. So the, then the final thing that I'm going to show you guys is uh, basically a, um, an, uh, a project where a group of kids, and they range in age, I believe, from about nine to about uh, 11 or 12, they basically banded together to solve a problem they cared about in their community, which was essentially recycling. And this particular group of kids had taken a number of different AI classes. They've been learning for about, I wanna say, three to four months. And um, basically, they, um, they actually won an international AI competition for the work that they did, which is called the Smart Waste Sorter. So let me find my quick time again, quick time go. So this is a small fraction of the video that they submitted to the competition that they won. 
That video was about three minutes. So I took about 30 seconds of it so that you guys can see the essence of the kids. These are the kids and this is what they built. And they used some Arduino to do this as well. The Recycle Squad. The battery was once sorted in recycling, which caused a fire in the facility. When someone tries to throw away flimsy plastic into a recycling bin, our smart waste sorter triggers a buzzer alerting them. So the basic idea here was that they wanted to help with recycling. They visited a recycling center. That's the one they showed in the video. They talked to a few people there and they found out that the items that caused the most trouble were the flimsy plastic and the batteries. So they wanted to be able to detect those. And then they went online. They found lots of pictures on Google on plastics and batteries. They took tons of pictures on their phone. You know, you, the pictures you saw were them basically holding batteries in their hand. And they other, did other tricky things like taking pictures of batteries while there was plastic in the background to say that, see whether the AI could do you know, better. And then they were able to train an AI that could tell the difference. And so now you can kind of see sort of the evolution. They start by trying out things. Then they become interested in building their own. So because they don't like the ones that they've tried out for some reason, they think they can make it better. And they usually can. Once they learn how to build one, then they want to apply it to some problem they're interested in. And there's so many different varieties. And they can do that with or without code. And then, you know, as their skills improve, they're able to tackle actually some very interesting problems. So they don't have to necessarily just be doing things like Pokemons or happy or sad, they can actually solve real world problems. So, so hopefully that gives you kind of an idea of what, why this process is doable and the way that it actually can be used for, you know, for real. Now, some of the free resources we have on our website, if you go to our website, http.aiclub.world and sign up for an account, please. There's a bunch of data sets out there. There's a bunch of example projects. There's a bunch of resources like blogs, videos. There are some blogs written by kids that show what they were able to do and what they learned. There's a bunch of videos on how to build AIs using the free accounts and the free resources, as well as a bunch of different uh, you know, resources we provide to parents and educators on how to explain the difference between AI and robotics, the relationship between AI and programming, stuff like that. Another way to get started, if you are a parent or a student, we also run classes for elementary school and also actually for lots of others. But if you are interested in elementary school, particularly, this is the link that you should go to. Um, and you'll see that we have actually a couple of classes that start two weeks from now and three weeks from now. So if you have a student who is interested in learning, please do sign up for one of those. If you're an educator, in addition to the free resources on the website, we also provide you know, structured curriculums for a wide variety of age groups. We provide live training for teachers. We start those batches periodically. And so if you're interested and you, you know, please send us an email and we'll happy to have a free one-on-one -on -one chat with you to understand exactly you know, what you're, who, who are your students, what are you trying to teach them and how we can help you. So those are the main you know, links to try, try on. Feel free to grab a free account right here. And then if you're a parent, please do check out our programs. And if you're an educator, send us a note and we'd love to talk to you. So I'm going to stop here and, um, and then take any questions. So Sindhu, can you yeah. tell how many, what are the questions that I should answer? Yeah. So we had a bunch of logistical questions like, you know, will the recording be available, et cetera. So maybe you can take those first. And then we had some very specific questions about the program as well. So uh, once you answer the logistics, I can like, uh, tell you a list of questions that we got. Absolutely. So basically the uh, recording will be uploaded to YouTube and will be emailed to all the registrants of the webinar um, after the, the webinar itself. So expect it like to tomorrow or so. Um, and then the slides will be put on SlideShare and will be, and the link to that will be provided as well. Mm -hmm. Were there other cool questions in there? Uh, logistics, I think that's about it. So okay. there are some questions specifically about AI Club. Um, so I'll group it into things. So one is about, is the AI club uh, software that you are showing them to build, is that free? And if it is free and someone takes a class with AI club, then how long is it available for after they have finished the class? Can they build their own projects once they have done the class? 
all good questions. So um, access to the AI Club tools are free if you get yourself an AI Club account. Um, there are some things you cannot do with the free account, like run very complicated things with images or run them for a long time. But you, I would say the vast majority, like over 90% of the, uh, the projects can be done on a free account. Now, if you take a program, what we do is we have a much more structured, um, you know, learning approach. And we also have an entire bank of videos and learning materials that we use to teach students that are not available in the free account. And to answer the specific question, if you take a class with us, the account will be available to you for one year after you take the class. So you can do tons of things, you know, after you take the class and everything you did in the class is available to you also for entirely that time period. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so uh, another set of questions is around the content itself in the classes. So one question is, do they only build or do they learn concepts? If they learn concepts, would you have a little bit of time to show like one or two uh, example slides of how they are taught? And the other question was, how, uh, how does the coding part come in? And I know you spent a little bit of time on it, but I still got a question from a parent about how do they code without getting started with coding when they learn about AI? Okay, so they're all good questions. So let me do, see. So first of all, uh, we actually teach concepts in all of our classes. And what I can do is basically maybe take you guys through our curriculums really quickly. And that will also probably help you understand what concepts are taught in each of the classes. So if you, so what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to stop sharing these slides. I'm going to share my browser instead and take you guys through the curriculum concepts. And I can also play for you a short video of an introductory concept. So, um, so basically, so if you look at, this is our website where we describe all of our curriculums and you can see that we have curriculums for elementary, middle school, high school, and also some self-paced curriculums. So let's click on elementary school for a bit. So if you look at it, basically what we teach in this elementary school curriculum is things like, what is an AI? How does it work? We give them lots of examples of what AIs in daily life look like. We talk to them about how do AIs learn? How can you teach it? How do we measure whether it's doing well? How do we measure how well it learns? And then they also build a whole bunch of different AIs. So that's the kind of content that we cover in middle in elementary school. And I will actually in a minute show you a sample video of some of that content in action. So now if you go to middle school and then the curriculums build up. Now middle school students can start from scratch. We don't assume that they learned AI in, middle, in, in elementary, but what they learn is first of all, you can see that for middle school, we have a curriculum of about nine independent courses and they proceed in conceptual depth. So the first one, they learn, you know, you know, similar to elementary schools, they learn what is an AI, what does it mean to predict? Now they learn more different types of AIs than the elementary school ones would have. They learn how to predict categories like happy and sad, but also numbers like the price of a house. They learn how to tune and improve an AI and how to measure it. They learn, you know, they build a bunch of different AIs. And so they learn two different uh, algorithmic techniques. One is called classification and one is called regression. Then, you know, in, para you know, in parallel, we also provide uh, Python classes. And so if you want to take a Python class and particularly this one, for example, assumes you have no um, in initial knowledge of Python. And so we teach everything from scratch here. And we teach them how to build a Python app, and then we teach them how to connect it to an AI that they might have already learned. Now, the second AI course assumes that they know a little bit about these techniques, classification and regression, but then we talk to them about different ways to implement them. And so nearest neighbors is an algorithm that they learn. They also learn other algorithms like linear regression here. And they build, you know, a, see a more advanced custom project where they get to not just pick the type of AI, but they get to pick several algorithms, let them compete. They learn how to tune the algorithms. There's a concept, a technical concept called hyperparameter tuning that they learn here. So that's the kind of stuff that's covered in M2. M3 is where they learn a very powerful type of AI called neural networks or deep neural networks. So they understand how images are, you know, look like to computers. They understand how computers read pixels. They learn how you know, deep learning and neural networks work. They learn how to train them, how to tune them, stuff like that. 
And then, you know, basically with future courses, the conceptual knowledge gets deeper and deeper. Similarly, we have advanced Python courses where their ability to manipulate data tends to, you know, we improve the, the power of that. We even teach them eventually how to build their own AIs directly in Python so that they don't necessarily have to use the tools, they can actually build their own algorithms. And so this is obviously you know, substantially more advanced, but you can kind of see that this is, you know, essentially an evolutionary concept where they start with basic concepts, particularly as early as elementary. That those are more about observation and more about understanding how it works by interacting with it. And then in middle school, they start to learn how it works by actually knowing how it works inside. And that increases their ability to manipulate it. High school is basically another level of sophistication. Again, you can start in high school without knowing anything, but it ramps up obviously much faster and much more aggressively. The other difference is that we assume in elementary school that you know elementary school math, which is, you know, and so we don't really have any math assumptions about elementary. In middle school, we assume you understand the concept of averages, and, but not much more than that. And in high school, we assume you've taken about an eighth grade equivalent of high school algebra, I'm sorry, middle school algebra, and that allows you to understand a bit more. So uh, maybe I can play a quick video of a conceptual learning that they do. Let me see if I can find you one. So this might be actually a good video because it's actually an introductory video that we use in middle school that will show you how we introduce the concept of AI and some of the key things that they learn about it at the beginning. I'm just bringing it up here. And this video goes on for about five minutes, so I'm not gonna play the whole thing, but I hopefully it'll give you an idea of what we're talking about. Let's start with a high-level explanation of what the terms AI and ML mean. AI is short for artificial intelligence and ML is short for machine learning. Artificial intelligence refers to the ability of a machine to perform tasks that mimic human intelligence. Today, there are several artificially intelligent applications that we interact with on a daily basis. Some examples are recommendation systems, automatic voice transcription, object detection from images, etc. The types of tasks that AI can do is ever improving in performance and complexity. So hopefully you get the kind of idea. I don't want to play a long video just to kind of because I think there are lots of people who are waiting. But, um, but the other thing I can maybe really quickly show you is uh, if I can find my spreadsheet is or maybe I can't find. So we basically have, you know, about a hundred so, or so different independent concepts that we teach. And we provide students with both live teaching as well as video recording so that they can go back and review the concepts if need be. So hopefully that gives you an idea. Okay, um, any other questions, Sindhu? No, I think that was about it. You already answered uh, some of the questions. Uh, about like, you know, the recording, the live, uh, since now every, everything is online, like how uh, these recordings are available for you after the class as well for review. So, um, and in case you miss a class, etc., you can like take them. So I think that part you already answered. I don't see any more questions. If I missed any questions, please feel free to uh, post them again, either on the chat or Q&A. Sounds good. Yeah, I think this uh, uh, webinar has gone a little over, but we'll be here for another three or four minutes. Thank you everyone, I really appreciate your time and I hope that if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us anytime and uh, we'd be happy to you know, chat with you anytime if you're interested in any of our programs or working with us as an educator. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you, Nisha. Thank you, thank you guys, bye-bye now.